They were the band that brought us Justified and Ancient. They were also the electronic duo who went off and set fire to a million pounds for art as a statement against capitalism or just because they had it. The question still remains, why? Jim Carroll has been reading about the 1990s band in a new book called The KLF, Chaos, Magic and the Band Who Burned a Million Pounds. The book is written by John Higgs. First of all, before we get into burning a million pounds, Jim, just put the KLF in the context of 1990s music, who they were and what that scene was. Basically, the KLF began with a guy called Bill Drummond. Bill Drummond was a musical mover and shaker in Liverpool in the late 70s. He was involved in various labels. He was involved in the management of such bands as Echo and the Bunnymen and uh, The Teardrop Explodes. He was always a bit different. He had ideas. He read books by Robert Hanton Wilson. He knew about the Illuminati. He knew about, like, magical thinking. He had other ideas. And he was always kind of trying to, I suppose, push his pop charges in different ways. To give an example of something he did, he once organised a tour, a bicycle tour for Echo and the Bunnymen fans around Liverpool called Crystal Day and the tour took the shape of Rabbit's Ears because it, it, it basically tied mm. into some kind of thoughts he had about this. The other guy in the KLF was Jimmy Cotty. He was a guitarist in a band called Brilliant who were signed to Bill Drummond's label at the time and the two of them came together in the late 80s in it basically around kind of different kind of punky kind of anarchist uh, uh, rave scenes and uh, uh, art scenes in London. Uh, Bill Drummond builds a stage set for, for, uh, for some from, some plays. Jimmy Cotty was playing guitar and hanging out in squats and they just came Came together and they started making music. The rave scene, I suppose, energized them because they realized then that any kind of Egypt could make music. They that, that was the that was the basic, I suppose, impetus. They could sample, they could put music together and do a DIY. But were they better than any kind of Egypt? Were they successful? Were they a good band? At, at the very start, they were they were just another pair of Egypt. You know, they were making music, which is it, it was fairly rudimentary. But they got better and better. And the whole thing about them about them, Sean, is that they were successful. They wouldn't have been if they have, weren't successful. There wouldn't be a million quid to burn in the first place. Yes, like that, that's that's the whole. <laughs> Thing. So they, they had a million quid in the first place. Correct. Nine, August 1994, they're on the Isle of Jura. What happens and why does it happen? It, the, okay, when you ask the, the, the why, the, 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 how it happened uh, is very easy to explain. The facts are as follows. In the middle of the night, Bill Drummond woke up a, a journalist called Jim Reed, who'd accompanied the duo and their roadie to uh, to the island. And he said, come on, let's go. We're going to burn a million quid. They went to a part of the island and they burned a million quid. It was filmed by the roadie and that was it. Uh, Jim Reed kind of knew this was going to happen. He'd been told this was going to happen he toyed with the idea he says of actually of actually hitting Bill Drummond over the head and stealing the million quid but that happened on the island in August 1994 the money was burnt uh, it was filmed that was it that's that's the, that's what happened. If it was today, you'd, I would ask you: Did they tweet that they were going to do this? <laughs> but we're back in in 1994. Did they did they put out any press release that this was going to happen? Did they publicise that it was going to happen? And, and, and you say that it was filmed. You know, how, how big an event was it? How public an event was it? Their PR is a guy called Mick Houghton, and I when I when I worked in, in various record labels, Mick Houghton, I, I knew Mick Houghton. I remember asking him, "What did you do? I mean, how did you actually prepare this?" He said he he said the two of them told him to keep it completely quiet. They picked one journalist and one one journalist only, Jim Reed, to document what was going on. There was no, there was no pre-advanced palaver. There was no, uh, like Rihanna, there was no 777 tour to publicise, publicise the fact, hey, we're going to set we're going to set fire to a million quid. They basically went to the island and they did it in front of two people. That was it. Now, that's the how. Now, what did they say afterwards about why they had done it? This is the thing. This is the thing, Sean. They can't explain it. They've never been able to justify it or explain it. They basically... They were kind of totally unsure what the hell they actually did and why they did it. You know, afterwards, a year, sometime afterwards, they toured a film of them actually burning the money and they were really taken aback by the anger the audience showed. I mean, any right-thinking person would kind of go like, you burned a million quid, what do you expect? But they were really taken aback that people didn't understand what they were, what they were on about. They themselves didn't realise it. They didn't really understand either. So basically they decided they were going to have a pact. Uh, after once, after one particular showing of the film, they met in a little chef diner somewhere in the Highlands outside Glasgow and they basically signed a contract. They, they were not going to discuss what happened on the island. They were not going to discuss their reasons behind it for a period of 23 years. And then in brilliant <laughs> KLF fashion, 23 entered the KLF story and not lot shown. But then in true KLF fashion, they sprayed the contract on the body of a Nissan Bluebird in gold pen and pushed the car over a cliff. Why 23 years? 
this 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 is this is where this is where the book when I came across the mentions of the Illuminati and Robert Anton Winslow, I went, oh no, we're going down this road. There are certain there are certain people listening to this right now. When I mention those names, they're kind of going, oh no, as well, because these these are heavy thinkers. These are heavy acid thinkers, you know. And then there's other people who are listed right now who've heard mention of those names and they're getting away from the radio as fast as they can. Twenty three. Please supposed come to- back and listen to what Jim has to say. <laughs> those people all know that twenty three relates to magical thinking and it's sort of like a, like I suppose alternative theories we're into the world of conspiracy theories we're into the world of just like like Mazars altogether we're into the world of people who look into the whole JFK assassination and come up with all kinds of wild theories and 23 relates to I suppose Different. The, the, twin, the number twenty three pops up in, in in works by William Burroughs and works by people in, in those kind of writers. And basically, what happened was Drummond and Cotty just became addicted to the idea of twenty three, and they began to see twenty three popping up in all kinds of places. And again, it tied into this whole idea about magical thinking and coincidences. All right. So John Higgs takes it upon himself to tell us. I presume he's trying to find some sort of why they're not going to speak about it. They say until what would it be? Twenty seventeen would be twenty three. Yeah, twenty seventeen. Yeah. yeah. So they're not going to speak about it until then. So what is John Higgs telling us? John Higgs is, has written a great book, it has to be said. John John Higgs, it, this isn't a straight biography of the duo because we don't really want a straight biography of the duo. You can't really have a straight biography of them because all the facts are already out there. What he's trying to do is he's trying to tie together all these these theories, all these ideas, all these different people that, were, that they, Drummond and Cotty were influenced by. What's really fascinating about the book and why the book actually is well worth sticking with is because it's so readable. Normally, if you're dealing with the likes of Wilson, Young, uh, all the, all these people, all these series, you just want to throw the book away because it's really heavy, it's really dense, it's kind of like it's bad hippie, it's bad hippie writing. In Higgs's case, he really kind of comes at it in a, in a very different way. It's it, it's not light, but the the associations between all these various people is really easy to understand. He joins up the dot, dots for a casual reader really really well. And who is contributing to the book? Who who is talking to him? Basically, it's Higgs. It's, it's Higgs, and he's taking he's he's kind of I suppose he's he's researching the people that they've been influenced by, the people who they've mentioned in 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 their in their various tracks before, and he's putting he's putting together the whole story based on all that. <laughs> KLF then, is, is there any relevance in what they did in their music and in this act, this I presume act of art, I don't know. Is there any relevance to it for, for contemporary musicians? The, the, very, the, the, the interesting thing about them, Sean, is that after they had the various number one hits with the tracks like Doctor into Tardis and What Time is Love, they wrote a book called The Manual, How to Have a Pop Hit the Easy Way. And the band called the Claxons basically said that they followed a step-by-step guide and they ended up winning, winning the Mercury Music Prize. I think for contemporary acts, it's very interesting to read this book and realise that you can actually be, I suppose, mavericks and you can be a bit different and you can actually succeed. It's worth bearing in mind that was 20 plus years ago and pop music has definitely changed. What's really interesting as well about the KLF is that they're known for two things. One is obviously the burning a million quid. And the other thing they're known for is the Brits dinner dance uh, in the early 1990s yeah. when they won the best band award. They basically turned up and played with a band called Extreme Noise Terror. And they also produced a dead sheep. <laughs> you could talk about this forever. I'm going to point out something about numerology, but I want you to introduce for me Justified and Ancient. Justified and Ancient, this is, this is probably one of the tracks that they're, be, that they're best known for. Uh, regarding numerology it's, it's un, and coincidence, it's also worth bearing in mind that one of your previous guests, as he, as he was leaving the studio, Simon Marr, pointed out to me that his brother was a tax consultant for the KLF. <laughs> 2017 is the year they say they will speak. 10 and 7 are in that. 10 take away 7 is 3. That leaves you with 23 numerologists. 